Let the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts find favor in your heart, O beloved, our strength and our joy. Amen. Amen. I'm standing in the middle of the airport in Belfast, Northern Ireland. And I have two options. One is to go out the door to my right, which is where the taxi stand is. And the other is to go straight ahead, out the front doors, out into the street and toward the parking area. I need to get to the northern coast of Northern Ireland, about an hour's drive away, and I've been told that taxis are expensive, and if I can find a car to take me, that that will be a cheaper way to go. And I've been told to go to the help desk and find a car. But it's five o'clock in the afternoon, and the help desk is closed, and nobody's around. So as I'm standing there trying to decide what to do, a man approaches me. He's got a starched white shirt on, and a navy tie, and navy pants, and a little cap on his head. I think it was the cap that sold me. <laughs> and he came up to me and he said, do you need a ride? And I said, well, I'm going to the Corimila Center in Valley Castle. Do you know where that is? And he said, well, I can put it into my GPS. <laughs> I'll get you there. And he took a hold of my rolling bag, the one that had all my worldly possessions in it, and he started out the door with the words, follow me. So I followed him out that front door, and about the time we got into the middle of the street, there was a shout from the taxi stand. And a man came running around the side of the building, and he said, hey, what are you doing? And he started to argue with the man who had my rolling bag. He said, hey, you can't drive her, you know that. That's not right. And the man who has my bag turns to him and says, I'm just taking a friend to where she needs to go. And the taxi man takes a look at my face and says, you liar. That's not your friend and you know it. You're not supposed to be driving her and you know it. And they're practically coming to blows in the middle of the street. So I step forward and I take a hold of my rolling bag, and I turn around and I head back toward the airport. And as I do, I see there's a little crowd that's gathered there, and they've been watching all of this going on. And as I approach the front door, one of them says to me, welcome to Belfast. <laughs> I managed to get to my destination, driven by the taxi man. And as we drove, he told me a little bit about the confrontation that had happened, and a little bit about the history behind it and the conflict that's been going on for generations there. I told him about the conference I was going to, about using storytelling as a tool for bringing people together in the midst of conflict. And when we got to my destination, he gave me his card and said, in case you need another ride or another story. <laughs> I heard a lot of stories over that week that I was there at Corimila in Northern Ireland. And what I thought was a conference on the power of storytelling became for me a conference on the power of listening. And as I listened, my focus began to shift from the details and the issues of the conflict that's been going on there, instead to the power of listening 
and the key of building relationships as the key to resolving those conflicts. Toward the end of the conference, I said to one of the presenters, who's been doing this work of reconciliation for decades, I think in the States, and especially where I come from in the Northeast, and in our communities, we're pretty good at focusing on the issues and social justice. We're pretty good at telling people, even those we're supposedly serving, what it is they should be thinking and believing and how they should be acting. I don't think we're so good at listening. And he said to me, listening is justice. When I went back through those doors to the airport in Belfast, I felt like I was a different person. And as I returned to the States and to my community and to my congregation, St. Peter's in Livingston, we shared some of the stories of the things that had been going on. I shared some of my stories from my time in Northern Ireland. They shared their stories of the listening that they'd been doing right here in our communities. And I think we both felt that as much as we'd been transforming the communities and the people around us, that we ourselves were being transformed. That there was a new connection that we were feeling to the people around us and to the communities and even to ourselves, and most especially to the people that God is calling us to be. So follow me, Jesus says in Mark's Gospel. Follow me out the door, out beyond the buildings, out beyond our comfort zones, out into our communities. Follow me into the middle of a street where there's conversations and confrontations and conflicts that have been going on for generations. And when you get there, stop and listen and know the power of listening to the healing and the hope that can happen and the transformation that is taking place in the communities, in the people, and in yourself as you become the people that God is calling you to be. Amen. Amen. As a younger man, during the late winter, early spring of 1995, preparing to complete my first year of undergraduate studies at Seton Hall, I remember receiving a call from my rector at that time, the very Reverend Tracy Lynn, <coughs> inquiring as to whether or not I might be interested in returning home and helping to run a summer program for local neighborhood youth. At the time, I didn't think much of it. As a college student, low on cash, with the prospects of another summer working at the mall staring me square in the face, I thought, sure. It's a paying gig, doing something that might be fun. Sign me up. The only prerequisite on the job description, she said, had to be my willingness to share my experiences growing up in the church. Harkening back to my days in youth group and the experiences that made that time in my life so meaningful. Take those experiences, she said, and fashion them into a four-week summer program. 
<laughs> I was told that I'll be working with a small team of like-minded individuals, including fellow church members, leaders from the community, and some faith partners from the other side of the largest river in the world, the Passaic River. <laughs> that was one of Reverend Lynn's most profound statements on the economic and social disparities that can be found simply by crossing that river. Whether I was simply not paying attention at the time or couldn't fully comprehend the complexities of what I was about to undertake, I completely missed the genesis for why this program was being formed. And more importantly, why it was needed at that time. You see, several weeks prior to that eventful phone call from Reverend Lind, a young man whose name was Lawrence Myers was shot and killed by a Patterson housing patrolman. Lawrence was African American, 16 years of age, unarmed. The patrolman, Ronald Cohen, Caucasian, 25 years of age, and had been on the force for just a few months before being assigned to a Housing Authority Drug Enforcement Task Force. The circumstances surrounding Lawrence's death were quite controversial. Lawrence was shot in the back of the head after a reported tussle with the patrolman. There were many questions raised about whether or not this officer should have been assigned to this veteran task force. Was this excessive force? Was it murder? Or was it simply a terrible, terrible accident? At the time, local officials at St. Joseph's Regional Medical Center described Lawrence as brain dead when he arrived. He subsequently died when his heart stopped at 11.15 p.m. on February 24th, 1995. As one can imagine, the ensuing civil unrest that gripped the city of Patterson was palpable. People were angry. They were scared. Young people those who knew Lawrence and those who did not were angry and scared. At the time, as reported in the New York Times, which published several articles about the shooting and the subsequent aftermath, police officers in riot gear threw up a protective phalanx around City Hall this afternoon after a brief spasm of street violence by youths angry over the shooting of an unarmed teenager. Usually busy streets, including the major commercial district along Market Street, took on a ghost town atmosphere after police cordons rerouted traffic away from City Hall. And most neighborhood merchants pulled iron gates over their storefronts. What turned into a tense afternoon in this old industrial city began with a peaceful rally and an appeal for unity from then Mayor William J. Pasquale Jr. The demonstration this afternoon broke up with teenagers running along Main Street 
some smashing store windows, and a very quick police buildup. As police cars darted about pursuing rovering youths, one teenager was struck by a squad car outside an elementary school on College Boulevard. A spokeswoman for St. Joe said, the young person whose name she would not release was in stable condition and was being kept in the hospital for observation. Young people were angry. They were scared. They had no constructive way to process what they were feeling. No means of channeling that anger into a positive dialogue on police community relations or how to deal and interact with the other among us. So, Richard, your task, should you choose to accept it, <laughs> is to work with us to engage our young people. Share your story. Share your experiences. Broaden the conversation. Listen, but do not judge. Light the way. What was born over the course of that sweltering summer of 1995 was a little program affectionately known as CityServe. It brought together about 20 young people from the local neighborhood surrounding St. Paul's Church, 13 to 15 years of age some who knew Lawrence personally. And together, we embarked on a journey of self-discovery. With the support of many civic leaders and community support programs, too many to name today, we picked up trash around our neighborhood. We built a community garden in close proximity to where Lawrence lived. We participated in workshops on conflict resolution and diversity training. We restored donated bikes so that each young person could take one home at the end of the summer. Most important for me at that time, we loaded up our vans and drove these young people out of Patterson across that longest river in the world. We spent a day in the woods of northern New Jersey, participating in team building activities and high ropes courses. We tubed down the Delaware River. Most of these young people had never been outside of the square, eight square mile border of the city. And here I am plunking them down in an air tube and floating them down the Delaware. <laughs> it was fantastic. Not only did that summer fundamentally change those young people and their outlook and perceptions of what is possible, it changed me. It changed my worldview. It completely upended what I wanted to do professionally. My mother, who is here today in this room, <laughs> will happily tell whoever will listen <laughs> that I should have been a doctor <laughs> or a lawyer or a priest. <laughs> but those were no longer options for me. There was still too much work to be done in Paris. At 
As the leader of a nonprofit organization, St. Paul's Community Development Corporation, I also know all too well the realities of needing to share stories. Stories to engender support for the work that we believe in and that is vitally important and necessary for the upliftment of our shared communities. This past December, as a part of my annual end of year appeal letter to our supporters, I shared the story of a student who briefly passed through one of our workforce development programs. Her name is Nikasia Wright. Nikasia came to our agency having been expelled from not one, but two high schools in Paris. Due to a pretty bad attitude and some anger management challenges, she was eventually brought up on aggravated assault charges. As a part of a plea deal, she was able to enter a diversion program for juveniles with mandatory counseling and referrals for supportive services. One of Nikasia's goals, her main goal, was that she wanted to complete the coursework necessary for her to obtain her high school When she arrived to us, she expected to be confronted with the same song and dance that she had heard when she was in school, or her multiple engagements through the court system. What she encountered, however, was a non-judgmental environment based on a compassionate understanding of her circumstances and the pangs of hurt and undiagnosed post-traumatic stress that her life's circumstances has wrought upon her. What she found were people willing to listen, to share their stories and their experiences. She was afforded an opportunity to decompress and refocus on what she felt was most important in her life. Nikasia obtained her high school diploma within three months of being in our program. Today she is working in retail in Paramus, New Jersey, and is planning to pursue a career in the culinary arts, a passion which she discovered while participating in one of our elective training programs. 23 years removed from that sweltering summer of 1995, still working to impact the lives of young people in the city of Patterson. Yet and still, there is more work to be done. As our churches continue to swim against the tide of relevancy, we need as congregations to be reaching out to the communities that surround us, sharing our stories, inviting people in, listening, lighting the way. In today's gospel, Jesus said to Simon and his brother Andrew, follow me and I will make you fish for people. And immediately they left their nets and followed him. That's it. The road map is there. All we need to do is follow. All we need to do is follow. At the end of the bishop's video 
introducing the theme of this year's convention, he states, and I quote, our stories are holy documents written on our souls. We need to treasure those stories, to discover those stories, to see God is working in those stories, and have the confidence and the competence to share those stories with one another. I can share with all of you the story of the summer of 1995 is truly a holy document that is written on my soul. And may this gathered community who has so graciously shared in my story, Lawrence's story, and Acacia's story, Collectively say, Amen. Amen. Amen.